So today I'm here to talk to you about how two grandmothers inspired a body of work on the Internet of Things and machine learning. I'm going to start talking about the two grandmothers. So this is Anita. Anita is 94 years old. She is saying Happy New Year here in this photo from this year from Florida where she lives with my father and also my stepmother. They live with her and they're able to take care of her 24-7, but up until just recently, she would go out multiple times a week to see my father playing in a rock band, multiple nights out of the week too. So she had a lot of spunk. This is Harriet. For those of you from the Northeast, you'll recognize that she is not living in Florida. She has a lot of snow. She lives in a split level on her own. She's 86. Um, she has a lot of energy. Um, if you were to look up the definition of matriarch in the dictionary, you would see Harriet's picture next to it. She's a combination of a Greek and a Scot, and so she has all the fire you could possibly imagine. And so she lives very independently and drives her own car, and up until she was about 80, worked full time. And the only thing that stopped her was she was hit by a car, and so she couldn't work full time anymore and regrets that greatly. So both of these grandmothers of mine have wanted to live independently at home. They've wanted to convalesce at home. They have no interest in living in a nursing home. Um, but living at home independently, even when you have parents or children taking care of you 24-7, is difficult. It's a difficult proposition. And the systems in our country haven't necessarily been designed to allow for people to convalesce and to age in the home. Everything has been oriented, at least in the past number of decades, towards facility-based care, getting people into nursing home, taking the most acute interventions possible to keep people alive in the last years of their life. So because of Harriet and because of Anita, and all the challenges that we've faced over the past number of years in helping them to convalesce at home, as well as this population of baby boomers who are turning age 65 at the number of 8,000 per day and will continue to do so until 2050. My company, Jania, started thinking about how we can leverage technologies, the Internet of Things, particularly as it relates to healthcare and machine learning, systems that grow smarter and smarter with more and more and more data, how we can use those two to our advantage to help people stay in the home instead of inside of a facility, how we can keep them healthy instead of focusing on their being sick. So I'll give you a quick definition of the Internet of Things and I'll go into it a little bit more um, in a little while. But essentially, the Internet of Things is a broad category. And so now we have sensors in our coffee makers, in our thermostats, in our refrigerators, in our home security alarms. We have room sensors. Um, and we have sensors all over our bodies with wearables and whatnot. And so this is the Internet of Things, where we're getting increasingly more connected. And so we're focused on this area of interconnected sensor devices and the potential from the information that they can tell about us, but again, as it relates to healthcare. So I'll start to talk to you a bit about my grandmothers before I tell you about the application of the information, because technology is great, but use of technology and appropriate application of technology is where it all comes to, comes to play. So I'll tell you about Anita. So Anita, being 94, long life, very few medical conditions up into the past couple of years. Um, but she developed lymphoma. Again, was able to manage through it, had chemotherapy, even though she was at the end of life, was very healthy, has been very healthy otherwise. Um, but unfortunately, she's gotten increasingly more frail. One thing you also might know about Anita is you could see her smiling in that picture. Well, Anita's very hard of hearing. And so no matter what you would ask her, she would smile at you and nod and say yes. And so you could never quite diagnose what was going on. And so no matter how lousy she felt, she did her hair, she would smile, she would nod her head. And so you could tell something was going on and she was increasingly getting more sick, but you just couldn't put your finger on it. And certainly not being clinicians in our home, you couldn't also tell what, what was going on. And so oftentimes, my father would take her to the emergency room. Now, being in Florida, the hospital facilities and the emergency rooms aren't the same as in New England. They actually have a policy in many of them to not tell you how long it might actually take when you get there. 
And so she would go to the emergency room with my father and she would sit for maybe six, seven hours in an immunosuppressed state around very sick people waiting, waiting to get some care. And unfortunately, she was exposed to things. She would grow weary. She would grow tired. My father sometimes would wait in the parking lot rather than bring her in the building to help her. Sometimes they would just go home and they'd just say, forget it. We'll just wait it out. We'll just see. We'll see what happens. We couldn't tell. We couldn't tell what was going on with her. The waiting rooms would be full. They were frustrated, and so they would just return home. But as a headstrong person, she would get up in the middle of the night, she wouldn't tell anyone, and she would fall, and she broke bones, and she would be back in the hospital. And again, we had no way of really knowing clinically what was going on, because her doctor would just send her to the emergency room. That was the only way we could sort of get data about what was going on with her system and what we might be able to do to help her. So let me tell you about Harriet. So Harriet also doesn't like to bother anyone. She doesn't want to call. She doesn't want to bother you. She doesn't want you to worry about her. And so she never would call anyone. But she has arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. She has high blood pressure. She has diabetes. And so when she gets sick, she gets sick. And so one of these occasions, she got sick. She finally broke down and called the doctor's office and said, my back is it's killing me. And they said, no, no, you're fine. It's, it's your arthritis. So she waited. And so then she, can, she called again. Well, I'm really, I'm getting up all the time at night. I'm getting up a lot. And look, everybody gets up a lot when they're old. They go to the bathroom a lot in the middle of the night. Don't worry about it. Until finally, she was so feverish and she was so sick she actually drove herself, because she would never possibly call us, drove herself to the hospital where they admitted her and she was at high risk for sepsis. She was going downhill all, already. Now for those of you who understand what sepsis is, it's a blood infection and every minute, every second counts when it comes to sepsis. Um, death is imminent um, and we unfortunately take a pretty broad brush approach to trying to treat it. It's, it's, a, it's some clinical assessment, but it's not good enough and it's not fast enough. So fortunately, she was caught in time, but she had a, a rough inpatient stay. She had a lot of time in nursing home after trying to prepare to go back home. It was a lot of energy expended on her part. It's hard when you're at that age to come back for that kind of episode. Again, all she had was a urinary tract infection. She just had we, markers in her urine that we could have easily told with just a dip with a, with a stick um, or just a sensor that would be able to tell us, but we didn't know. And so instead, we had an extensive inpatient stay that probably would have ended in death. And she ended up coming home, and it cost the system a lot of money and a lot of, a lot of obviously, pain and suffering. So once upon a time, we used to live in villages. We lived near our family members. We were able to look into their eyes. We were able to take care of them. We lived in tenement buildings where we'd get their groceries and we could all be close to one another. Now, lest I wax nostalgic over this, I also know that our mortality rates were really high and we certainly didn't have the highest quality of life as it came to the healthcare system. However, um, we did live nearby. Right now, we often live thousands of miles away from our family members. There I am in the nifty pantsuit, and my grandmother, who would be quite mortified, is the, in the house coat in Florida, thousands of miles away. Difficult to diagnose over the phone, difficult to talk to caregivers, difficult to talk to their physicians. Anyone who's sandwiched between aging parents and small children understands how challenging this is. And it's really difficult, even when you're in the same room to assess them clinically, never mind if you're thousands of miles away trying to guess what's going on with them. And with this explosion of people that are turning age 65, 8,000 people a day turning age 65, we also have fewer and fewer people available to care for them. So we're trying to, in our system, move people into acute facilities, nursing home facilities. We don't have beds for them to be in facilities, and we don't have people. We don't have a population base right now big enough to care for this aging population. And so we're really in quite a dilemma. And frankly, most of us don't want to be in a nursing home anyway. And healthcare is a $3 trillion industry. We spend $3 trillion in healthcare. And yet, for that $3 trillion, 
we have the lowest quality and worst outcomes of any industrialized nation in the world. Um, we have the highest infant mortality rates. We have the highest rates of um, use of um, MRI and other imaging, and yet we have such poor outcomes. So we're spending all of this money, and for, to what end? So that people could sit in waiting rooms in the ER for six and seven hours and not get treatment? It doesn't make a lot of sense. And so this is why we're focused on this, and why we're trying to find different technologies that might really make a difference for people like Anita, for people like Harriet, for you, for me, for our parents, for our children, where we could really help people convalesce in the home much more effectively. So this is where we come to the Internet of Things. Now I'll give you some examples. This is a Garmin watch. We've used these in running for a long time. This little Garmin watch, which has also been used and has derived and much from military applications, um, has a global positioning device. It tells me my respiration. It tells me my heart rate. It shows what my um, pace is. It actually can tell um, what my cadence is. And it shows me how long my feet have left the ground when I'm running. It has an, um, it has an accelerometer, so it actually shows some positioning. Um, if I'm bending over, if I'm not, so what my posture is and how effective I am at running, it's a watch. It's a running watch. And yet it's a very sophisticated device as it relates to data. And it provides continuous data. From this watch, I could tell that for some reason, every time I finished a race and I came across the line, when I would stop, I would have a vagal reaction, which for those of you who aren't in medicine is when you have the dry heaves, which isn't pleasant. And so I couldn't ever understand why. However, when I looked at the data off of my watch, I could see that my, my heart rate drops precipitously, and so clearly there's an underlying condition. All from a simple watch that's just been used for, certainly for fitness purposes. And now we're in an age where there's much, much more. So this is a device that I can wear that's an FDA approved device that also takes my pulse oxygen. It can read an EKG from, from thousands of miles away that a nurse might request. It has my pulse. It has um, respiration. It checks the temperature. It can see my perspiration rate. And it provides all sorts of data that shows up on one of these simple little devices that you can have in the home and that we all have in our homes now. This, the information also transmits wirelessly up to the cloud and clinical algorithms are run against it. And so we can actually run so that we know and can send alerts when someone's blood pressure is out or if they haven't moved for days or if they, their, their pulse is too high. Um, we also connect it with scales and with other devices, blood pressure cuffs, so that we can also tell other information. So if I have a congestive heart failure patient and their weight goes up a pound or five pounds over a weekend because they ate potato chips, we know and we can intervene before they end up in the emergency room. But we get objective information about their condition. And there are more and more and more of these sensors now available as wearable devices, um, as implants in our bodies, um, certainly uh, in now all uh, starting to be made in our clothing. And so that all of this internet of things, all of this data is now being consumed and we can run clinical algorithms against them so that we can warn, we can alert on illness that's coming on, um, on health that's starting to decompose. Um, and we can be far more predictive and far more effective in terms of the interventions. So our interventions aren't six to seven hours in an emergency room, in an inpatient admission, and an outpatient in a, in a skilled nursing facility. It may be that for that congestive heart failure patient, we fix their air conditioner because it got too hot in their house. It may be that we're, we understand that they have a slight blood and a uh, slight urine infection, and we can prescribe appropriately antibiotics. And nurses and physicians and family members can now watch people from afar and more effectively take care of them. So it means a lot better life for all of us, less exposure to virus and diseases, much greater potential, and certainly peace of mind. But sensors are binary, and the alerts are rudimentary still. And even though they're a long way, even where they are today, than where they were yesterday, there's still much greater potential, because physicians 
are so tired of all the alerts and they're tired of false alarms. And so by applying the concept of machine learning, where the field of computing, where the computers get, the systems get smarter on their own by providing a closed loop where we can provide feedback to them and indicate a, a positive alarm was in fact a positive alarm, the picture of a cat is in fact a cat, and by using these types of systems, we can now churn through all of this big data and now predict illness, look at biomarkers for disease, and anticipate when someone's health is going to decompose and personalize those interventions for an individual. And so it's the intersection of those two where it becomes really incredibly powerful. And so I'll give you a good example um, where Lockheed Martin applied rocket science to the concept of sepsis. And so Lockheed Martin built the missile defense system for our country, so our concrete shield. And so they use machine learning algorithms to sense whether a gas grill is a gas grill or it's a missile coming into our country. And so they take data off of sensors all over and read heat data that comes in from all over to determine whether we're under attack or not. And this this system is built sort of like um, a moat around. So it's not industry specific. So it isn't just for missiles. So they took it and trained it on healthcare data, large volumes of healthcare data. Now sepsis, there's a few very simple clinical biomarkers for, the, for indication of sepsis. Right now, we get about 70% accuracy rate when we're, when we're predicting sepsis. Um, with the Lockheed Martin's approach, we are now at a detection rate of 90% with just, just small trials of this. Um, we're accuracy at about 99%, whereas current industry is about 35% um, in terms of uh, indicating on patients without sepsis. And so the, there's significant potential. They also were able to indicate 14 to 16 hours earlier than best clinical judgment. So the best best methods right now that we know to indicate on sepsis, this identifies 16 hours prior to that. So there's significant potential in all sorts of disease states for all sorts of correlations that we didn't even know existed before if we're to take the two um, and use them for research purposes. And so what does this mean for us? Well, it certainly means that we may have longer lives, we may allow our family members to convalesce in the home. Um, it means that we have greater peace of mind. It means that we certainly can impact, you know, another area that I feel passionate about, which is the, the cost of healthcare in our, in our country and the quality of healthcare in our country, that we can be more accurate, we can be more predictive, and we've had this for some time, and it's just a matter of leveraging it now and bringing all of this together. So thank you.